Father, thank you for the rock that is the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you that he is the cornerstone. The rock upon which everything stands. Father, thank you that in your steadfast love, you have made the rock of the Lord Jesus to be our refuge. We recognize that Jesus is a stumbling stone to many. A rock of offense and ridicule across our world. And yet for those who can see with eyes of the heart, Jesus is a rock of refuge and strength, a sure fortress that will never be shaken. Father, thank you that we can cling to Christ and have hope in this life and in the life to come. Father, thank you that Jesus is alive, that he has accomplished all for which he came at the cross. And thank you that he keeps his promise to build his church, to save a people for himself, and that he will return again in glory in that great day. That he will bring with him justice and full and final rescue for those who are here. Father, would you be glorified as we worship Christ today? Father, would you be magnified as we have lifted our voices in praise, as we come to you in prayer, and as we open your word to see the glories of Christ in the pages of your scripture? Lord, we recognize that the preaching of your word is in vain unless you speak louder than I can speak. So Holy Spirit, would you come and work through your word in our lives that we would be changed. Be glorified in this time as we continue in worship. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Our children, ages 5, 6, 7, and 8, are headed to Children's Church now. They're going to have the opportunity to uh, study the Scripture, learn the stories of the Gospel, and the hope of eternal life there on their level while we have the opportunity to open the Scripture together. Uh, if you have a Bible, let me encourage you to turn that on or open that up to Luke chapter 9. Believe it or not, this will be our last week in Luke chapter 9, Lord willing. Uh, that we get through the six verses that are before us. We're at the very end of Luke chapter 9, verses 57 through 62. This past Thursday, we recognized and remembered 80 years since the D-Day invasion. I know that uh, for many of us that seems like a very, very long time ago. It was June 6, 1944 this invasion took place. By early May of that year, on the southern coast of England, there were gathered almost 3 million Allied troops. Nearly 7,000 vessels, seafaring vessels, from the American, British, and Canadian forces combined. And over 12,000 aircraft. It's the largest invasion force in the history of mankind was gathered there. Operation Overlord had been planned with quite a bit of controversy, quite a bit of vying opinions as to which one was right, where should they go, exactly how should this take place. But they sat there with the Allied Expeditionary Force. This was the front edge of the spear, the invasion force of 175,000 men waiting on one man to give the command. General Dwight Eisenhower. Ike, as he was known. And Ike was waiting too. He was waiting on the weather. 
He was waiting on his weatherman to tell him when they could safely cross the channel, when the tides would be right for the invasion, when the channel would be close enough to flat, and when they would have a little bit of cover to get across to surprise the defending forces of the Nazis there on the northern coast of France. The weatherman came in with the forecast early in the morning on June 5th going to be a 36-hour window where this just might work. So they made the decision before dawn on June the 5th that they would set out across the channel overnight on June the 6th with the first attacks coming about 6.30 in the morning just at the light of dawn. The decision was made, okay, let's go. And over the day of June the 5th, General Eisenhower made a speech and distributed um, across uh, the 175,000 of this expeditionary force, allied expeditionary force that would be the front tip of the spear, this message. Soldiers, sailors, and airmen of the allied expeditionary force, you are about to embark upon the great crusade toward which we have striven these many, many months. The eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you in company with our brave allies and brothers in arms on the fronts. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in a free world. Your task will not. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, and battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. But this is the year 1944. Much has happened since the Nazi triumphs of 1940 and 41. The United Nations have inflicted upon the Germans great defeats. In open battle, man-to-man, -man, our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air and their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together in victory. I have full confidence in your courage, devotion to duty, and skill in battle. We will we'll accept nothing less than full victory. Good luck, and let us beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble undertaking. The sign below was the signature of General Eisenhower. His message to the D-Day troops laid out the mission before them and called them to the demands of that mission. As I mentioned, we're here in Luke chapter 9. It's been a momentous chapter in the book of Luke. It's a turning point in the book of Luke. Upon the chapter 9, the entire book hinges because Jesus is no longer prioritizing the Galilean ministry. He has set his face to go to Jerusalem. The disciples now know who he is. The great declaration, the great confession of the apostle Peter, you are the Christ of God, has taken place. Jesus has now begun speaking plainly. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to die. I'm going to rise again. He's speaking plainly to them. They didn't fully get it yet. But the wheels are in motion. It's one of the recurring themes we have seen in this chapter is Jesus' calling and commission of his disciples to follow him. It's taken a whole new shape. Because what following Jesus means looks a little different than it did in the chapter Following Jesus means denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following him. And as Luke concludes this chapter, still in teaching the disciples who are around him, he has encountered with three, we'll call them would-be disciples, who all have an interest in following Jesus. But then Jesus lays upon them the demands of what it means to be his disciple. If you have your Bible, look with me in Luke chapter 9, verse 57 through 62. Hear the word of the Lord. 
as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, Follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Leave the dead to bury the dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of the Lord. The main point that we see here as Luke is setting it before us is ultimately the demands of following Jesus. The demands of following Jesus. We see this broken up into three sections, two verses each. We get three individuals, and each one is laying out a different aspect, a different dynamic of what it means to follow Jesus. We see first in verses 57 and 58, following Jesus demands no longer holding on to the comforts of this world. Look at verse 57 and 58 again. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. This man's public statement, public commitment, was quite vast. Wherever you go. It makes me wonder how long he's been listening to Jesus. Because if he's been listening, it hasn't been that long ago that Jesus said, I'm going to Jerusalem. I'm going to be rejected and I'm going to die. You wonder how long he's been paying attention. More likely, he's seen the attention. He's seen the fame. He's seen all of the people flocking around Jesus, the masses. He's seen the miracles. He's heard them put the other religious leaders to shame. And he's like, that's the guy I want to follow. We're going to Jerusalem. Let's go rout some Romans. That's what he sees. He sees glory and fame. He sees a kingdom. Let me ride on the coattails of that guy. I've heard and seen your power. I'm in. Let's go retake the city. His words kind of remind me of the old hymn, Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever He Leads, I'll Go. My immediate thought with that phrase is, no disclaimer there. See, I feel like we often live with a disclaimer. We often live with a little footnote, a little asterisk next to that, wherever, so long as it's not here or there. So long as you don't call me to go back here, Jesus, wherever you lead, I'll go so long as, and we give our conditions. Jesus responds to this would-be disciple with kind of a startling statement, verse 58. Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. The fox, after a long outing of routing the fields for small mammals and and birds, comes back home to rest, to sleep in his den before the next day's action takes place. The birds of the air soaring high upon the the winds realize that Where Israel is seated, there's a migration of birds that at certain points, nearly all the birds of Europe fly across Israel for a few months out of the year. And it is literally about half a billion birds that fly across this very narrow stretch of land. But they all have nests. They all have a place to land, to rest before the next day's flight. But Jesus asserts, I have nowhere to call home. It's interesting. You say, well, didn't he grow up in Nazareth? Couldn't he go back to where Mary was and his brothers and sisters? He, he's got a home. He, after all, he, he lived there with Peter and his family for quite a while there in Capernaum. That's kind of a home, right? Jesus did not come to establish houses and cities and lands. He didn't come to found a country. 
think about it. He left the glories of heaven. He left dwelling in inapproachable light with the Father and the Spirit. And he came and took on a flesh like ours. God the Son, wrapped in full humanity, was born in a stable, a barn, laid on a hay trough. Following Jesus is not a road of comfort and ease in this life. It's not pleasure and fame here on this earth. And anyone who tries to sell you on the idea that following Jesus brings wealth and prosperity, comfort and ease is not following Jesus. Following Jesus demands you no longer hold on to the comforts of this world. It doesn't mean it's sinful or wrong to have a house or have a bed. It's not what Jesus is saying. But rather what Jesus is demanding is that we not cling to those things. So, some people have read this and the, the result is they take vows of poverty. I can't own anything to follow Jesus. Well, I don't think that's a right reading. Clearly Peter himself owned a house. But rather, the demand is, are you willing to give it all up to follow Jesus? Ultimately, God is the owner of it all. God owns everything. Everything you claim to be yours, it actually belongs to God. And at the end of your life, it's going to belong to somebody else because God's going to give that stewardship to someone else. You are to care for what God has placed in your hands with wisdom and to use it for his purposes while it is under your care. Yet we recognize for many Christians over the centuries and even today in certain places around the world, to faithfully follow Jesus means that they will lose their job. Means that they will lose their family, their inheritance, their home, their freedom, even their lives. We are called by Jesus to hold everything with an open hand. What happens when you hold something with an open hand? It can easily fall out, right? As long as the Lord gives it to you to be there in your hand, it is your stewardship to, to care for it well, for his glory and for his, for his fame. And we will praise him for what he grants us to steward well. But if the Lord takes it all, we will praise him and continue to live for his glory. See, truly following Jesus has never been a joyride on a bandwagon. That's what so many of the crowds were after. They thought, this is fun, this is great. But truly following Jesus is not a joyride on a bandwagon. Those who claim to follow Jesus for the treasures of this life and this world have bought into a lie, and when they come face to face with him, they will see the emptiness of those pursuits. In Dwight Eisenhower's words to the Allied Expeditionary Force on the eve of D-Day, he wrote the sobering reality that they would face. Your task will not be an easy one. Your enemy is well-trained, well-equipped, battle-hardened. He will fight savagely. In other words, the road on this mission is not simple. It's not a road of ease. They were not called to comfort. They took the vessels across. And you can see the pictures. You can read the accounts. The front door would drop, and they had everything they would use for the next 11 months on their back and a rifle in their hands as they stormed the beach and climbed the cliffs. It would be a road of hardship and suffering and struggle. How are we as Christians to function like that? How are we supposed to even think like that? Not, not, to, not to hold on to my home? How can we live without, without home, without, without having a home base? Moses writes to us in Psalm 90, verse 1. O oh Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. There's the home we can cling to. There's the home that we don't hold with an open hand because he holds us 
That's why Jesus writes and speaks to us and says, in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go prepare a place for you? And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. Brothers and sisters, that is home. Here on this earth is not home. There is home. And when we are resting in the Lord, confident of our eternal dwelling with Him, then we can joyfully hold all the comforts of this world with an open hand and say with Job, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, following Jesus demands no longer holding the comforts of this world. Second demand, following Jesus must be your highest priority. Look at verse 59 and 60. To another, he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Following Jesus demands that he be your highest priority. Jesus' interaction with this second dis disciple is a bit awkward. In fact, some of you are reading this and you're thinking, ouch, that's, that's kind of strange. In fact, some have interpreted this that we don't go to funerals, which is a wrong reading. Jesus himself attended some funerals. Of the three, this is the only one to whom Jesus initiates the conversation. Presumably, this guy was listening in. As the other guys came up and said, I'll follow you wherever you go, Jesus answers him and then turns and says, what about you? You follow me. He lays it upon him. But Jesus' interaction seems harsh, even contradictory, because honor your father and mother doesn't expire when you move out of the house. Jesus calls the man to follow, and the man answers, let me first go bury my father. Jesus' answer almost comes out as a rebuke. Look again at verse 60. Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. To understand a bit more clearly, it helps us to understand the context of the day. This man was not in the midst of grief after his father's passing. They didn't have funeral homes and the processes that we have today. In, in fact, in, in Hebrew culture there in that time, the, the person who passed would be there in the home and they would sit with the body for about 12 to 24 hours, wrap it and put it in the grave. They didn't have an embalming process that they went through. It was a very quick, someone passes, they sit, they grieve, they wrap, and then they put them in the grave almost immediately. Had this man's father been dead at home, he would not have been talking to Jesus. He would have been with his father's body. So what does it mean? What does he mean when he says, I must go and bury my father? What he's saying is, I must stay here until my father passes away and make sure he's cared for properly. But this could have been days, months, weeks, years. We don't know. Decades. And we, we sound this like, well, that sounds kind of honorable, right? He wants to care for his aging father and presumably mother as well. That, that's, that's honorable. That's good. In fact, Jesus rebukes the religious leaders when they neglect this. In Mark chapter 7, we read this account as he's speaking to the religious leaders. Jesus said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and mother, and whoever reviles father and mother must surely die. But you say, If a man tells his father and mother whatever you would have gained from me is korban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father and mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down and many such things you do. See, the Pharisees of the day had created a rule where they could devote their entire estate, all of their wealth and belongings to God upon their death, which meant they couldn't give it to anybody else because it was all given to God. Nevertheless, it remained under their control to use however they wanted while they still lived. 
And Jesus rebukes them, saying, you're, you're rejecting the command of God. You're not honoring your father and mother by neglecting them through this false rule that you've created. So we could see this young man here in our passage in Luke chapter 9 is really wanting to help his parents. But would that have garnered the rebuke that Jesus gives? When I dug a little deeper into this, what we see is this man wanted to be around to settle his father's estate, to collect his inheritance before following Jesus. In fact, even today, as I've, as I've done some research, this phrase, I must bury my father, is still used today in the Middle Eastern cultures to speak of saying, I must stay home until he's gone so I can bring his estate to a final point, and that way I can get what I deserve. I can get my inheritance. This guy had possibly heard Jesus' previous statement. I don't have a home. I don't have a place to lay my head. He's like, well, I'm not going to follow if I don't have a place to sleep. Let me hang out here until I get my inheritance. Then I'll be set. Then I can follow Jesus. That's what's going on in the passage. This man's heart wants to make sure that he's counted his, his stuff in his basket first. And then Jesus says, leave the dead to bury the dead. It's a clear play on words. Those who are spiritually dead can bury those who are physically dead. Your inheritance is not your highest priority. Following Jesus is your highest priority. No other priority in this world comes above following Jesus. See, we, we face this temptation all the time. We face this temptation because we think, I'll get serious about following Jesus when this season of life ends. When I get to this point in life, th then I'll really buckle down and follow Jesus. We think as young people, well, when I get to be an adult, I'll, I'll, th then, I'll, then I'll get serious about following Jesus and, and obeying what the Bible says. Or, or we think early in our careers, when, when I just get my finances to this point, then I'll be comfortable enough to actually not work on Sundays and follow Jesus. Hear this today? Jesus accepts no second place positions. Jesus will not accept a second place in your life. No matter what your season of life, your highest priority is to follow Jesus. Notice also Jesus' call. He calls the man to go forth and proclaim the kingdom of God. Literally, it's the idea of having gone forth. Once you get up and follow, it paints the picture of what you're doing as you follow. You're getting up, you're following, and you're sharing who Jesus is. You're proclaiming the kingdom of God. You're sharing the gospel. You're calling others to follow as well. Following Jesus demands that he is your highest priority no other priority that rivals him. He is number one in your life. In Eisenhower's message to the Allied forces there on the eve of D-Day 80 years ago, there was a theme that rang throughout it. It was the singular focus needed to combat the great evil threat. He said, the eyes of the world are upon you. The hope and prayers of liberty-loving people everywhere march with you in the company of our brave allies, brothers in arms on all fronts. You will bring about the destruction of the German war machine, the elimination of Nazi tyranny over the oppressed peoples of Europe, and security for ourselves in the free world. Our air offensive has seriously reduced their strength in the air, their capacity to wage war on the ground. Our home fronts have given us an overwhelming superiority in weapons and munitions of war and placed at our disposal a great reserves of trained fighting men. The tide has turned. The free men of the world are marching together in victory. Eisenhower's words conveyed there is one singular focus. There's a lot of things going on, but there is one singular priority. He laid it before the men on that day. And that focus was supported by the efforts of the entire free world. See, the demand for following Jesus requires that he takes first place in everything. And this only makes sense 
that he would be first place in our lives because that's the end for which all creation is headed, that Jesus would be first place. Colossians chapter 1 beautifully speaks this way of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. Some translations will say, first place. That's the end to which all creation is going. That Jesus would be first place in it all. Friend, if Jesus is second or third or a tacit honorable mention in your life, then you are not following Jesus. Jesus came to this world, took on flesh like yours and mine, because our sins had put us at enmity with God. He had made us enemies with God because we are made in the image of God, but we fail to live according to God's standard. We have all rebelled, and God cannot allow rebellion to exist. He cannot allow it to continue. And so he brought justice. He brings wrath against all those who rebel against him, but he did not leave us there without hope why he sent his son. The Lord Jesus Christ came, wrapped himself in flesh like ours, was born into this world, no home, no place to lay his head. And yet he lived the perfect life that you and I could not. And by dying on the cross, he took the punishment that your sins earned and my sins earned. And he rose again three days later, conquering sin and death and the grave so that you could be forgiven and granted eternal righteousness before God. This is the good news of the gospel, and Christ is the Savior, but he's also the Lord of all. You see, a lot of people think that they can just have Jesus as Savior and not have him as Lord. But you will not find that in the Scripture. You will not find that idea. It is foreign to the Bible. To be saved by Jesus means to receive him as your Savior and your Lord. You cannot be saved from your sins apart from submitting to Jesus as Lord of your life. And being Lord, it means master, boss, king. If you are not following Jesus as your Lord, you are not a Christian. Turn from your idolatry. Turn from following the things of this world, from following your own sinful designs, and worship Jesus alone. No other God of this world can save you. If you continue to seek to wear the crown upon your own head, one day you will face King Jesus and realize the crown only fits upon him. Christians, brothers and sisters, all the things of this life are trying to buy for priority in your life. Keep your eyes on Christ. Serve Him only. Submit all other loves to His Lordship, for He is Lord of all and must take first place. The demands of following Jesus require that He is first in your life. The third demand Verses 61 and 62, following Jesus demands no delay and no turning back. Look at the text again. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This third would-be disciple is in a similar situation as the second. Both acknowledge Jesus as Lord, but then immediately afterwards say, but first, I need to do this. See the parallel there? The second one says, Lord, but first, let me go bury my father. And the third one says, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell. Jesus following you sounds great. 
but I'll be coming along later. I'll be along in a bit. Just as the second guy, with the second guy, Jesus is not condemning caring for aging parents. Here with the third, Jesus is not condemning loving your family and saying farewell, letting them know, hey, I'm, I'm off on this. It's not what he's condemning. Jesus is pointing out and rebuking that when the loves of this world cause us to delay or turn back from loving him first, we are not following him. Remember the great commandment? The lawyer comes to Jesus, which is the greatest of all the commandments, looking to trip him up, looking to, looking to cause him to stumble. And he, Jesus says, the first commandment is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Commentators have long seen the connection between these two. If you are not loving God supremely, you will never love your neighbor and those around you rightly. They go together. We are called not to turn back. When God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, the command to Lot and his family was to flee and not even look back. But we know from Genesis that Lot's wife turned and looked back and was turned to a pillar of salt. Paul writes in 2 Timothy chapter 4 about a follower named Demas who started well and followed well but then turned back. We read this in 2 Timothy chapter 4. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Gone to Thessalonica. Turned away. Chasing the things of this world. But rather, Paul's exhortation in Philippians 3 encourages our hearts in this. He says this, Not that I've already obtained it or I'm already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Let those who are mature think in this way. Jesus' response to this third man comes out of the agrarian society. Lots of them were farmers. They knew what it was to plow a field. Look at verse 62. Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You'll never plow a straight furrow while looking backwards. You can't plow a straight line in the field if you're always looking over your shoulder. I, I remember the scene from Pilgrim's Progress early there in the book as Evangelist has called young Christian before he has found the wicked gate to seek the light at the wicked gate. And Christian begins leaving the town and his family is calling to him and his friends are calling to him, come back, come back, don't leave us. And Christian plugs his fingers in his ears and runs to the wicket gate, hollering, life, life, eternal life. When Jesus calls you to follow, as we saw earlier in this chapter, it is a call to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him as he set his face like a flint to go to Jerusalem, unshifting, unchanging. So we are to set our faces upon him and his kingdom, unchanging, unturning. See, following Jesus is not a temporary assignment. It's not a brief hobby or a passing interest. It's interesting to note that across the New Testament, Jesus never calls someone to a momentary decision. I don't know if you've ever realized that. Jesus never puts somebody on the spot for a brief momentary decision. The exhortation is always an ongoing, dedicated, following life. A life following him. There are no other ends to which we are to look. Again, from Eisenhower in his message to the Allied Expeditionary Force, he did not mince words with them about the gravity of what lay before. He said to them, we will accept nothing less than full victory. We know from history that on June the 5th, 1944, 
Dwight Eisenhower scribbled a little note on his sketch pad of what would be his admission of defeat if it failed, essentially taking all the blame upon himself. But the demand laid upon the soldiers that day was full victory. We will not retreat. We will not retract. We will not stop until the ends for which we set out are attained. Christian, keep going. Keep your eyes set upon Christ. Keep following Jesus. Keep looking to the cross, knowing that after the cross will come the crown. If you are not a Christian, following Jesus. Jesus calls you to put your hand to the plow and not look back. He is not Lord and Savior of those who are merely testing the waters or trying out a test run. Following Jesus demands that you don't delay, that you don't look back. Jesus demands your all, your full devotion, your whole life. If you are not a Come fully, come entirely, forsake what lies behind, and cling to Christ alone. For here is where you will find forgiveness. The forgiveness of your sins and life eternal. Submit to Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. This past Thursday was 80 years since D Day not an overstatement to say that the events of that day have shaped the life we live here and now. General Eisenhower, not known for drama or making big, a big to-do about the events of that time, ended his message to the Allied Expeditionary Force with these words, let us beseech the blessing of Almighty God upon this great and noble God's merciful hand of providence was upon the soldiers that day while nearly 10,000 American troops died in that single day's invasion, invasion on June 6, 1944. They forged a beachhead that would bring about an end to World War II over the next 11 months in the European theater. Eisenhower's words on June 5th laid out what the mission was and the demands of that mission. Similarly here in Jesus' words, we see the demands of what it is to follow him. We see the demands of what it is to be part of the mission of Christ. Following Jesus demands you no longer hold on to the comforts of this world. Following Jesus demands that he be your highest priority. Following Jesus demands that there is no delay and no turning. Christian, are you following Jesus like this? Or has your devotion waned? If you are not a Christian, count the cost, but remember the reward. Following Jesus will lay demands upon your life. You are saved by grace through faith alone, but you must receive Jesus as both Savior and Lord and follow Him. Lord of your life. And here is where true joy is found. Here is where life eternal is found. Not in living for yourself, but in living for the one who lived and died and rose again for you. Turn from your sins. Come, follow Jesus. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the demands of the cross, the demands of what it means to follow you. Lord, help us each to count the cost and to come willingly and eagerly because you alone have the words of eternal life. Father, would you work in this time in our lives? Would you move in us and conform us more and more to the image of your Son? 
glorified as we respond to your word. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. This time is a time to respond to the word that's been shared. Our musicians are coming back up and they're going to lead us in a final song. And as they do so, it's an opportunity for you to respond. We believe that the word of God, as it is proclaimed, creates a response in people. The word of God never goes forth without accomplishing its purposes. So respond to that which is resonating inside of you. Whatever the Lord has pricked your conscience with, laid heavy upon your mind and your heart, you respond to that. You can respond by praying right there where you are. You can grab the hand of the person next to you and say, hey, would you pray with me over these things? I'm going to be here at the front. I would love to pray with you. Whatever it is, during these time, this time, you respond to the Lord. And after you've had that time to respond, wherever we are in song, would you join us as we stand and sing together?
gospel life is a Christ-centered, 